Hello everyone. Today we're going to be talking about detective literature. Now you might be wondering, why should I care? Well, there's two reasons that I can think of right off the top of my head. Number one, you have an exam or a test coming up that requires you to know something about detective literature. Or two, you're one of those cool people like myself who think that it's super interesting and one of the best things you can read about. So regardless, here we go. When did detective literature become a thing? Well, to start with, some people argue that it can be traced all the way back to the Romans and the Greeks. However, general consensus is that it began with Gothic literature. Stories such as Anne Radcliffe's Mysteries of Udolpho and Walpole's Castle of Otranto are classical works of Gothic literature that are the epitome of the genre. Both of these stories feature a mystery, and the characters within these stories aim to solve the mystery and restore the world's order. How did something like Sherlock Holmes arise from Gothic literature, where there's ghosts and wives locked up in the attics? Well, it is pretty simple. Just add some logic. Instead of ghosts, have it be an actual man in a costume or something, anything that adds realism to the mystery. And it is this logic that Edgar Allan Poe used in his Murders on the Rue Morgue in 1841. The story centers around a mother and daughter who are murdered, and Dupin is brought in as an acquaintance. And he isn't there to solve the mystery for the cash reward. He in fact refuses it in a few other stories, but rather he is doing it just to exercise his logical thinking abilities. Dupin himself is a man of noble birth who is in reduced circumstances. He is living in an apartment with his narrator, who remains unnamed throughout the entire series, but who is essentially a Watson. The story doesn't begin in the traditional way a detective story would be, which would be to drop you in the middle of the action, but rather it begins with a rather lengthy explanation of the deduction process. There is quite a long section at the beginning, which just goes through details making sure that the reader knows that Dupin is not a magician, and that the author isn't trying to cheat you. However. Nowadays, when we're so familiar with the genre and how deduction works, we don't need this sort of introduction, so it is quite unusual for a modern reader. Dupin lives in Paris, and of course, much like Sherlock Holmes, he is often sought out by the police to solve these mysteries. And of course, it benefits everyone that he never asks for money, so great, free help. Poe continued to write about Dupin for a couple of stories. However, in the end, it was never a story that caught on anywhere near to the extent that Sherlock Holmes did. I could talk about Sherlock Holmes for the entire day, but for the sake of brevity, we will keep it clear and concise. Sherlock Holmes appeared in the novel A Study in Scarlet in 1887, where he and Watson first meet and, of course, solve a rather anti-Mormon story that involves a bunch of Mormons. Arthur Conan Doyle later in his life apologized for the ignorance he portrayed in that story because, dear lord, if you read it, and I do suggest you do, you will notice that the pacing is quite different than what we expect. First of all, it's a Sherlock Holmes novel. Those tend to be quite a bit more difficult to read than the short stories. Hound of Baskerville is excluded. That one's quite modern. But A Study in Scarlet takes quite a turn. You expect the whole story to be about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, but instead there's a giant detour in the middle of it where it is just a bunch of Mormons in the middle of nowhere USA. Now, it's not a bad story. It's just not what we're accustomed to and not what you're expecting when you're going in for a detective story. Of course, at the end, Holmes resolves everything and it's all clear cut and finished, but it's very sudden and quite unusual compared to later works. Early in the story, Watson is introduced to Holmes, and this is how Conan Doyle writes the meeting. This was a lofty chamber, lined and littered with countless bottles. Broad, low tables were scattered about, which bristled with retorts, test tubes, and little Bunsen lamps with their flickering flames. There was only one student in the room, who was bending over a distant table, absorbed in his work. At the sound of our steps, he glanced around and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I found it! I found it! He shouted to my companion, 
running towards us with a test tube in his hand. I have found the reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and nothing else. Had he discovered a gold mine, greater delight could not have shone upon his features. Dr. Watson, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, said Stamford, introducing us. How are you? he said cordially, gripping my hand with a strength for which I had hardly given credit. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. How on earth did you know that? I asked in astonishment. Never mind, said he, chuckling to himself. The question is about hemoglobin. No doubt you see the significance of this discovery of mine. It is interesting chemically, no doubt, I answered. But practically... Why, man, it is the most practical medical-legal discovery for years. Don't you see that it gives us an infallible test for bloodstains? Come over here now. The short story, A Scandal Bohemia, became so popular that Holmes was an international success. And when Conan Doyle decided to kill him off in The Final Problem, people actually wore ribbons symbolizing mourning for the loss of that character. And the constant harassment and constant questioning eventually drove Conan Doyle to resurrect Holmes. Fine, it was also quite a bit of financial incentive that Conan Doyle was pretty bad <laughs> with money and none of his other works were nearly as popular as his home story so of course why not bring him back make some extra cash holmes is an amateur he does it as his profession however he isn't a professional the police are the professionals however they often seek out his help just like the general public does and he tends to be much more successful in his attempts compared to the quote-unquote professionals because Holmes isn't tied down by any oaths he took as an officer of the law, he's allowed to make his own judgments. There are many stories in which he lets a murderer go free because he feels that the murder was justified, or any other criminals that he feels were either in the right or simply had already learned their lesson and would gain nothing from going to prison. And believe me, you didn't want to go to prison in the Victorian era. It was quite unpleasant. <laughs> Holmes does this work because he feels it's fulfilling. He doesn't do it because of any cash reward. He's often offering his services for nearly free, if not entirely free, for people he thinks can't afford it, and turning down much more lucrative cases just because he thinks that they're boring. Holmes is arrogant, but he's also genial, selfless, warm-hearted, and the perfect gentleman. It is these heroic qualities, combined with just his unusual behavior, that make him such a likable character. His relationship with Watson, which is so intrinsic to his character, also makes him much more relatable and a much more interesting story due to the fact that Watson forces him to communicate the way he's thinking to the audience, to us, through him. He's the one who's willing to ask the stupid questions so that us, the audience, can follow along and not feel cheated out of a proper explanation for how Holmes produces his answers. Now, a lot of adaptions portray Watson as a bumbling fool, which is understandable if you want to make Holmes appear like extra genius, but that isn't necessary. Watson is a perfectly competent character in his own right. Just because he isn't as smart as Holmes doesn't mean that he isn't smart. He is quite intelligent. It's just that the stories aren't about him. The stories are about the people around Holmes and the way that Holmes affects their lives. Of course, Watson becomes an, an unforgettable part of it. However, it is not Watson's goal to make himself appear to be the smarter of the two. Conan Doyle knew perfectly well that people would know of Edgar Allan Poe's Auguste Dupin. So, of course, he wrote it into one of the stories. Here's the quote. Watson is speaking. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe. No doubt you think that you're complimenting me in comparing me to Dupin. He observed. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. That trick of his, of breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an apropos remark after a quarter of an hour's silence, is really very showy and superficial. He had some analytical genius, no doubt but he was by no means such a phenomenon as Poe appeared to imagine. Obviously, Dupin is the original classical detective. However, original and most popular aren't always 
synonymous. So Sherlock Holmes is by far the most well-known detective, especially in classical literature. He is the iconic detective of classical literature and his stories lay the framework for the next century and a half of detective media. Of course, ironically, Arthur Conan Doyle wasn't a huge fan of his creation, and he often bemoaned the fact that he was only known as Sherlock Holmes's writer, rather than for any of his other more intellectual books. And he was known to say that he would consider his life a failure if he was only ever considered worthy of remembering for his Sherlock Holmes writing, which, <laughs> too bad. I guess he... I guess... Well, I guess he thinks that his life was worthless. Okay, so how do you identify a classical detective story? Well, there are a few things. Number one, the detective is generally a gentleman, and he is active between the years of 1841 and the early 1900s. Number two, they follow their own moral code, occasionally ignoring police and traditional legal procedure, simply because they don't believe that it's necessary or that it's excessive. And number three, the world is a good place that becomes unbalanced after a crime, but regains its balance when the mystery is solved. No matter what happens in Holmes's world, once he has solved the mystery, it seems that everything is fine. Of course, there's more crime and London is far from a good place to live necessarily at the time it was a mess. It's not good for your lungs. However, that doesn't really matter. In the general... In the big picture of things, everything is fine because balance has been restored. And that is something crucial. And although it's not unique to detective fiction of this era, it is something that cannot be forgotten. Okay, if you're interested in some very good Sherlock Holmes adaptions, I can highly recommend the Jeremy Brett series from the 80s and 90s. They are truly fantastic. Billy Wilder's The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes is also quite good. And the BBC Sherlock series is a masterful mashup of all the Holmes stories. However, I would suggest that you perhaps either stop at season two or don't go in, not don't go any further than season three. I have words, strong words for the writers for whatever the heck season four was. Anyways, and if you're into radio shows, there's a wonderful series of audio dramas from the 1940s when Dr. Watson suddenly appears to be living in California. Don't ask why I think he would be either 80 or 90 moving to California from England. If the temperature difference didn't kill him, then the trip would have. But regardless, he sits in California and recounts his tales while drinking a brand of wine that no longer exists. It's quite good. It, they feature Basil Rathbone. And they run from about 1939 to 1946, so when they're not talking about the detective story, they are talking about war bonds. And you get some very, very fun historical ads thrown at you, and it makes you just kind of thankful that you weren't living during World War II in America. Anyways, I hope you found this video informative, and I hope to see you next time. Please hit the like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this video because apparently that's what I'm supposed to say at the end of these videos. Nice.